right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the first ever ADP List Growth Session. My name is Felix, and I'm the co-founder and CEO at ADP List. We already have close to 300 people joining us today from around the world. So if you can, please comment where you're joining from. This is a virtual session. So today, we, for the first ever session, we have someone very, very special um, to the design industry and the entire design community around the world with us today. I um, mean, it's truly our honor uh, to have uh, Jacob, Jacob Nielsen um, here, who obviously needs no introduction. Hey, Jacob. Hello, Felix. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, I want to maybe give everyone some in introduction of Jacob, just in case, you know, you have not heard about the great stories of Jacob. Um, so Jacob Nielsen, uh, he's a PhD, um, is a usability pioneer with already more than 40 years of experience in UX. Uh, he founded the Discover the, the Discount Usability Movement for Fast and Cheap Iterative Design, something that I use at ADP List and many of the startups that I work with as well, um, including the heuristic evaluation and the 10 usability heuristics. So if you have, as a designer, I'm, I'm pretty sure you've heard of the 10 usability heuristics. And, and here you are looking at the man himself who invented that. Um, he formulated, obviously, the Jacob's Law of Internet User Experience. He's named the king of usability by the Internet Magazine and the guru of web page usability by the New York Times. Um, and the next best thing to, to a true time machine uh, by USA uh, Today. I'm not sure why, why that happened, so we'll dive, dive a little bit uh, more into that. Um, and he started the uh, obviously the Nelson Norman Group, um, and and he was previously um, a um, at the Sun Micro Microsystems Distinguished Engineer, and obviously he was also a VP of Research at Apple before, I believe, in the nineteen nineties. So in the very early so actually just to this is actually my my colleague Don Norman who was at Apple. I was never at Apple. I turned down the okay. job. Okay, okay, <laughs> yeah, okay. So your colleague and and the founder of uh, yeah. Uh, was at Apple and and you were at uh, Sun Microsystems. So both of exactly. you were at Silicon Valley uh, during the the high time of 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 the computing age. Um, and uh, Dr. Nelson as well holds seventy nine uh, US patents. So that's tons of patents for a designer. Uh, I've not met any designers with that amount of patents. Probably except for some Apple engineers or or Apple designers. So uh, with that said, yeah, I'm I'm pretty sure everyone knows. Uh, what Jacob is about now, and uh, we will get started to dive into the session. So, Jacob, uh, first of all, you know we are very excited and very honored to have you here with us today. Um, you know, I just want to start off with a question. You know, how how's the year been for you? You know, we're in December. How has twenty twenty three been for you? Oh, it's been it's actually been a, been a great year because I kind of reinvented myself. I get, got back to my roots as a creative, you know, scientist and writer because I used to run this consulting company, which was a lot of hassle and administrative overhead. And I don't want to bother you with that, but as you know, you run your own company, but it, it is a lot of work to, to run a company. So I actually stopped that in the beginning of the year and, and then I took a no month vacation, but then I was back you know, at the keyboard and I've been cranking out a lot of, of kind of new um, insights, I think, because I feel like this year is, a really revolutionary year in the user experience field and actually in, in the world with artificial intelligence all of a sudden becoming real. I know I've been in working for 40 years and for all these 40 years, it was always like a joke, you know, AI, yeah, yeah, it'll come later, you know, but, but now it's all of a sudden it's here. And so that I think is a really enormous change, which I think is very, very exciting. And so for me personally, it's been a great year to get back to my roots of, of actually thinking about what it means to to change the world of computing and what that means for user experience rather than you know trying to get more customers and those type of things which is not really what i enjoy thanks for sharing Jed, um you know jacob it's it's a it's a big year and and i agree with you everything with ai coming up and and obviously before we dive into sort of a little bit of your story while we're at on on, on this topic um you know you have been in obviously the very early days of the com computing, you know, revolution. Uh, obviously, with Steve Jobs inventing personal computer and you know Dell and whatnot. Um, are there any similarities of, of what you're seeing with with AI right now and some of the the bigger inflection points in the tech industry? Yeah, I think there are a lot of similarities. So I've actually been living through 
uh, three revolutions. You know, first the PC revolution, because I actually started back in the mainframe era, <laughs> you know, with, with text only interfaces and all of that. And then we got the early personal computers and the early graphical user interface, and that made change basically, it changed almost everything. And then we got the web revolution which again changed almost everything. And now we have the third revolution, which is the AI revolution. And that again is changing everything. And I, I think that, that, that it's hard when you live through history to really appreciate how historic a moment it is. But this is the, this is the year. I mean, next year will be exciting too, but this is the year where it, like, it boomed. And I can kind of as an equivalent, I can refer you back to 1993 which is when the web started booming. Now, the web was actually invented two years before, but it started with the text-only user interface. And then uh, Mark Andreessen invented the graphical user interface for the web with the web browser that was called Mosaic first, and then Netscape, and many more now. But that was a big thing. And during that year of 1993, I was, I was working on it. You know, I actually wrote a book about hypertext before the web. So I was kind of engaged in these type of technologies. But the boom was several hundred thousand percent growth in websites from just a handful. I mean, the web was just for fun or so a few academics, and all of a sudden it became the way we do things. We do business or we shop or we connect with other people, all those type of actions. Web was the way it's done. It wasn't all that happening in one year, but the, the, the year of that boom, and that started the dot-com bubble, which had good and bad you know, implications as well. But I think that's the equivalent of, of this year, um, uh, 2023, is that year of all of a sudden we're living through historical times of the world changing under us. I call it the tech quake. It's like, ah, you know, wow. every, everything is changing. And I actually think it's bigger. I mean, I lived through the PC revolution, the web revolution. I think the AI revolution is bigger because it's not just a user interface uh, revolution, even though it's that as well. But... It's actually a revolution for the world economy. And so I'm more equated, not so much with the web revolution, but rather with uh, the agricultural revolution, you know, 10,000 years ago, or the industrial revolution, maybe 400 years ago. Uh, so for the agricultural revolution, you know, you went, we went from having to, to hunt the food to grow the food. And the industrial revolution, we went from having to use muscle power to make things to having steam power. I should just say, some kind of power source. It could be steam power, it could be electricity, it could be nuclear energy, whatever it is. Uh, but that was a big change. You don't have to like personally struggle to do something, you can't get a machine to do it for you. And now we have the AI revolution, which is the cognitive equivalent, which is that think we don't have to rely only on biological thinking power to get ideas, to get things done, right? So it's, it's very much that equivalent. And what I'm waiting for so we're still in that early, early stage. And so the equivalent of the Industrial Revolution is when they had just invented steam engines, you know. Well, you can use a steam engine to crank out, you know, more machine, more, more, more metal parts, cheaper and faster and all that's great. But then one day, some person said, what if we take a steam engine and we put it on wheels and on tracks or rails? And now you have a, a, a locomotive, you know, and you can move, wow, 20 miles an hour, 25 kilometers an hour or whatever fast and you can pull an entire you know car full of, of parts of goods another car full of, of coal you know to to feed the steam in the locomotive but anyway and now of course we have much much better locomotive now we have also automobiles whatever other ways of moving around airplanes but thinking about you could put a steam in you could take a steam engine and not just have it in the corner of a factory but put it on wheels that's what I'm expecting. I'm just saying it's going to get faster. So that's what I'm expecting next year, the equivalent for AI. Right now for AI, taking the historical perspective, it's like with the web in 1991. You know, right. it's it's text only. It's not actually text only. You can have image generation, video generation. Yeah. But the user interface, which again is kind of my, my love, um, is this chat interface. It's long scrolling, scrolling, infinite streams of text, which is awkward to, to deal with. The way you command it is, is prompting, which leads to what I call the articulation barrier, which is you have to articulate in writing, in prose, what you want, describe what you want in words. Most people are not very good at that. Now, the people on this call, because right, they're all like designers and creative people and so forth, 
they're better at articulating and, and making things come. I have this vision in my brain. Here's like a representation of it. The average person is not. So the average person has great difficulty in using current AI. And also when you get out, oh, stream, stream, stream of scrolling text. Again, that's a usability problem. And I, I am I am very upset to be, I mean, I can, I can I'm very upset that <laughs> what I call the big, the big AI, like the open AI, the mid journey, all those companies have so little attention to usability because you can just do like a yeah. day's worth of user testing on those products and find a long list of ways to improve them. I've even done some of those studies with an intern. Yeah. And yeah, an intern, you can hire an intern and you can improve these billion dollar products in a day. And it's just a disgrace they don't do it. But I mean, his, history repeats itself because that's what happened with the PC revolution. Like, okay, DOS, anybody remember DOS? Well, that was a, an abomination. Yeah. Or early websites, man, I mean, sometimes they were pretty graphic, but they were still an abomination. So, yeah, history repeats itself. Thanks for sharing, uh, Jacob, you know, everything from agricultural revolution to the industrial revolution. Um, and, and obviously, just a quick note, uh, if any open AI designer is seeing this, obviously, there was a message from Jacob. Um, but, you know, I, I think for all of us, you know, one way or the other, our lives is going to be intertwined. Um, into this AI revolution that, you know, Jacob just talked about. And Jacob, I almost feel like, you know, you shed so much context um, that I have no choice but to ask this question right now um, because you, you really had witnessed three major revolution, uh, including the PC revolution. Um, and obviously, I think for your entire life, you've seen many things as well that, that might seem like a revolution, might not seem like a revolution. And this AI is a revolution that, that obviously seems so similar to what you have seen before. Um, and, and being in these moments uh, for a few times now, and it is incredibly rare to be in three of these moments in one single lifetime, you know, now that as young people, you know, we were just looking at and being in this moment, what advice do you have for, you know, first timers who are, who are going to such revolution, right? Like what, what should we look out for? What should we be, 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 be prepared? What should we be really expecting out of this AI revolution for ourselves as well? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's a wonderful time to be young because we're just starting scratching this, this surface here. And so, again, if you compare with these other three revolutions, well, I was actually young at the PC revolution. And that drove a lot of my early careers that all of a sudden software design was important. In the mainframe era, it was not important because people just had to suffer whatever the mainframe did. With the PC revolution, the person using the software was also the person buying the software and therefore it was important, it was easy to use. And so usability became much more important with, with PC software than for mainframe software. And that created a lot of opportunity and interesting things in my early career. And I feel it's 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 very it's gonna be very similar here because there's gonna be so many things done differently over the next 10 years than they were in the past because of the AI revolution. And when things are done differently, I mean, again, it's everything has a double side duality to it. So there's a dark side of unpleasant side, which is a lot of times these things are done wrong. They're bad design. They don't use user experience methodology. But on the other hand, there's also the opportunity to actually create something completely new. And again, think back to the, the web revolution. Um, those of us, I, I wasn't like completely young at the time, but you know, I was, I actually had, I was actually in many ways at the perfect scenario because once you have kind of like 15 years experience, that's the kind of power uh, yeah. decade where you know, you don't know everything, you never know everything, but you know a lot and you can just crank it out. And so in that sense, uh, that may be better in a few years, but but yeah, the ability to do make all these new things happen, I feel that's an incredible opportunity. Uh, and the only thing is you've got to get on that bandwagon because it moves very fast. And so you've got to get experience with with AI in many ways uh, of just like, what is it? What can it do and what can it not do? I mean, maybe it, it, no, not just maybe, it will do more in the future. But right now, anyway, you've got to know what it can and cannot do and what it's good or bad at. And then how to design for it, how to uh, employ it also in all our, our UX me methods, like how to do, I, I kind of say ideation is free now because you can ask AI, give me 20 different versions of this and it gives it to you in like a minute. So things that used to take days, um, you know, um, I'm, I'm tomorrow actually publishing an article on my, my Substack on the, the new India government's uh, regulations about dark design patterns. It had like 12, they are kind of have been illegal in India, which I think is a great, great initiative. Anyway, so I wrote an article about this. And, okay, I'd like to get some pictures. And it looked was less than an hour, 12, 
uh, nice illustrations from 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 you know AI for this article. So a lot of things we can do in the past it would not have been feasible unless you had a gigantic uh, budget to commission twelve illustrations for one article. So a lot of opportunities, things we can do. But what's the right way? What's the good way? How can you personally become you know, twice as productive as in the past, which you which you can, you know. Um, oh, sorry. One thing I also want to mention before we move on is, what about if this is, this is just a fluke? What is it? Is it just hype? And I have one way of term saying why I think it's not hype. I think other things are hype. A lot of sort of like ideas for three dimensional user interfaces. There'll be some use for that, but mostly it's hype. All the blockchain. Yeah, there's some use for that, but mostly it's hype. The reason I think AI is not hype is the research we have already, which is controlled studies comparing, you know, with and without AI. And all these studies show enormous productivity improvements. You know, anything from 33%, which is the low end, and 33% is huge. Almost no studies. You, I mean, I've done many measurement studies in my career. It's very, very rare to get, you know, if you get 10%, you have done really well. But 33% is like the lowest, which is for elite management consultants, up to more than doubling, which is more than 100% gain for programmers using GitHub uh, Copilot. Um, so, so these are enormous practical gains in just people doing the same work as they did before, just now twice as productive. Now, this is, of course, not the end goal, because yep. we have something called the task artifact cycle, which means that if I change the artifact, which is the tool, in this case, I give you something like a co-pilot, you shouldn't just do the same as you did before, but twice as fast or half the time, twice as productive. You should do new things because now you can do other different things. As I mentioned before, ideation is free, but we should do designs that rely more on many design alternatives. Now we can do that. So that's the task, the way we do our, our, our activities. They should change when our artifact, our tools change. Once you change the way you do things, then you, the cycle continues and you change the way you do the, the tool. But so, so these things move. And, and um, I think what we see now is just the very small beginning in enormous gains in how all knowledge work is done. And so I, I think that my analogy is that Artificial intelligence is, is a, a forklift uh, for the mind. You know, Steve Jobs said that the Macintosh is the bicycle for the mind. If like, you can move move smoothly, right? And that's a, that was a great analogy. But I, I call it the, the forklift because it, just like in a warehouse, you know, in the old days, to be a warehouse worker, it had to be a really strong guy and move, move these yep. heavy boxes around. And a weak person would never get a job there. Today, right warehouse you drive a forklift truck so you don't have to be strong to move a heavy pallet you just have to be be good at knowing it should go there rather than there so it's a good analogy that is yeah it's just an analogy but ai is the forklift for the mind now and so it changes all knowledge work and as i said the empirical data the the measurement data shows incredible gains without even changing the workflow which is the next important step for us Right. Thank you so much for sharing that, Jacob. It's, you know, so much to take in. And, and especially I think what you're saying is like, you know, that this really isn't a hype. You know, I think a lot of people are still kind of living in denial and thinking that is this a hype? Is this something that I should really jump on or should I be sticking to what, I, what I'm doing right now? But as you mentioned, you know, there is there is no deny when you look at the data, uh, especially with, with Copilot and, and GitHub. And I think, you know, many design tools are coming up as well with AI. Um, you know, I'm noticing more designers like getting into it as well. This is a great thing. And, and I think, you know, to, to your advice as well, uh, for designers that is living in this AI revolution right now, um, whether you're young or, you know, young at heart, I, I think, you know, is to just jump on it, right? You know, like yourself, uh, you know, Jacob, that you've been through so much, you know, of series of evolutions and, and you're still here, you know, at this AI revolution, which is, which is just really, really incredible that, that you're, you're jumping on as well. Now, I, I want to sort of like dive a little bit deeper into, um, you know, your career, right? I, I want I want people to sort of understand, you know, uh, a little bit about, you know, where, where you came from and obviously, you know, your story. And, and, and I think more importantly, you know, how you go on to kind of get into this field of, you know, human computer interaction and, and, and usability. Could you share a little bit about, uh, obviously, you know, on, on a high level? Um, you know, your story of, of getting where you are today, 
um, and, 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 you know, some of the key moments in your career that really shape you um, into, you know, Jacob Nielsen. And I think that, that, that there would be a lot of things that, that happen. I would love to kind of like hear a little bit more about your hero's journey. I think it, it always helps, you know, the audience to understand, you know, uh, you know that, that, that individual and that human being that they are listening to. Right. Well, I got in, but I mean, in, I was actually originally a computer student, computer science student. And uh, I was just extremely dissatisfied with the, what we would, now we would call the user experience. We didn't use that word back back in the 1970s. But I was very dissatisfied with how unpleasant it was to use the mainframe that the university gave us students. So actually, when I was in high school, so backtracking even older, um, I'd actually used a computer that was a very old, very weak computer, but it was a computer that we could have hands on. Each person used the computer. Um, and that was a relatively pleasant and exciting experience for me as a young kid in high school. Then I got to university, now I got the big computer, man, and the big computer was terrible and it's so unpleasant. So that, that contrast between computers being fun in high school, being depressive or oppressive, I should even really say, at university, that struck me very deeply. And I thought, well, we can make it better because I know it can be better. Yep. And so that's why I started doing usability in graduate school. And so uh, I was the only only one. I mean, I was actually just yesterday talking to like University of Washington's uh, graduate students. There's like an entire room full of these students. But back then I was the only one. And so when I, I lived at the time in Denmark. So when I graduated, there were three jobs in Denmark in the entire country. It's a small country, but there were three jobs in user experience. So two of them were at one person at each of the two biggest software development companies. And um, those two people, each of them were in, in charge of, of helping about a thousand developers make better user interfaces. So that's a tough job. And then the number three person was uh, in charge of trying to make nuclear power plant, power plant control rooms easier to use to have fewer accidents. But those three jobs were taken and there were no other jobs. So I actually became a university professor um, and I spent several years uh, teaching uh, user experience and doing some research. And, and um, what was interesting was that we didn't have a really big budget. I was trying to apply for research grants. Like I, I applied to the Danish Science Foundation for research grant to study hypertext user interface. And they say, oh, hypertext, we don't believe in that. That's not worth, worth you know, spending money on. And just like, Three or four years later, the web came out. You know, <laughs> this just shows you that those those funding agencies they don't know what they're doing. Um, so, anyways, we didn't. Ha I didn't have a lot of money, but the benefit of that again, you're always going to take the opportunity and advantage of your situation. So I got. That's why I invented discount usability, like ways of doing cheap, fast studies, because I didn't have this huge budget. I worked at IBM for a while, uh, and they had a lot of money, you know. But as a university professor, I did not, and so I invented ways of doing it on the cheap. Yep. And so I did that for a few years, but uh, then I got a job offer from the telephone company in the United States, you know, the Bell Labs, Bell Communications Research, which was a part of Bell Labs owned by the regional Bell operating companies. And so uh, now I got a lot of money again. <laughs> so that was a very well-funded organization. So I went there. That was a very, very elite research lab. And yep. in fact, that was the first uh, place in the world to really do good user experience work before I came, you know, back in the 1950s where they invented the touch tone telephone and designed that. And that design has been used more than 1 trillion times since those wow. early developer designers that designed the design. So that was, and they did a good job, luckily. Um, yeah. But so I worked there for a few years and there's only one downside of the phone company, which is it's a big bureaucratic, slow moving company. So a lot of things that I remember my colleagues invented, for example, a better way of doing email. And the phone company said, we don't believe in email, make uh, the yellow pages easier to use, you know, like the way yep. you can look up in the phone directory. So I then I got a job offer from Sun Microsystems, as you mentioned before. So I, I got a job as what they call distinguished engineer, which is like the top 0.1% of the technical talent in the company. And so the work dis, um, description of, of, of job description of distinguished engineer is that you are supposed to be a world expert on whatever your topic are. There were people that invented public key cryptography or invented the Java programming language. In my case, I was an expert on usability. So yeah. you should figure out what's important to work on. We're not going to tell you. We're not going to hire you know a, a top expert and then just waste their time. You should find out what's important. And that's where actually when I got into the really doing work on the web, because to me, it was very clear. Now we are talking, it was 1994. So just a year after that 
explosion of the web I mentioned before. So it was very clear to me, just as if somebody gets a job next year in AI, you know you're going to have to work on that. So I worked on that. And that's when I wrote the book, like Designing Web Usability, that came out, was my best-selling book ever, actually. And um, I did a lot of work on making websites easier to use. And then after a while doing that, um, I kind of concluded that making better user experience is no longer just a matter for um, Silicon Valley or the technology business. It's really a matter for every company because with the web, you know, a user ex interface, a user experience becomes your customer interface. Brand yep. is experience in the digital age. It's not your logo. It's like the experience. So we've got to teach these companies how to do interactive experience. And that's right. when I met, uh, match up with Don Norman, who had that, that, that same uh, idea. And so then we, we did a consulting company for many years. As I said, I just kind of got out of that um, yeah. and re reverted to my old you know, core of like actually really thinking more deeply about what does it take to make the world a better place um, and not just our clients, you know, but, but, but for the world. And I feel like that's, that's I've almost like come full circle in that 40 year experience, you know, of, of working through all these different revolutions yeah. and very, very many different places. And now, I mean, if you're going to like describe my job title, it's kind of like independent influencer, I guess, because, <laughs> because I don't have any clients. I just do what I think is right, which I feel is honestly very gratifying. Thanks for sharing your story, Jacob. You know, I, I think one of the, the the key takeaways, you know, from, from that is really, you know, how, how you've really adapted to all these changes. And I think more importantly, sort of like how you make the most out of that very moment. And especially, I think when you talk about being in a company with not much resources and then you obviously invented the way for you know very fast and cheap duration I, I i mean you know there's so much opportunity right now in the ai revolution as we talk about um where such opportunity is present for designers or just anyone engineers are uh, working on it as well now we you, you know we we also touch a little bit on on obviously the usability heuristics that that you, you came up with um you know you, you wrote a book on on web usability as well uh, which included those 10 um and, and, and you know one of the questions that that i think i i got you know and, and i i went i went to twitter and, and i basically tweeted you know i'm interviewing jacob tomorrow what questions do you have for them and and this was the most light question on, on online was that you know um out of the 10 usually heuristics is there anything that you would change today looking back right is there anything that you feel like you know would would have evolved or maybe you were wrong about the, yeah. the usability heuristics like you know a little bit yeah. of introspective here if you could share oh exactly well i don't think any of them are wrong and that's actually interesting in its own right that they I, i'm celebrating the 30th anniversary in, in a few months so they wow. i wrote them in 1994 you know so 24 will be the 30 year anniversary and you no know, all 10 i still believe in I mean, maybe I actually regret in retrospect that I came up with this name heuristics because it's a little bit too complicated. I should have called them something more more snappy. But but anyway, no, I think all 10 are, are still uh, true. And that's because they are core and fundamental and deep. Uh, any like more superficial guideline, you know, like how to write a command name in Unix, well, that kind of goes away when you have icons instead, right? You click on an icon rather than typing in a command name. But these deeper things like visibility of system status and so on, that, that is core and therefore it doesn't change. And it would apply if you're doing a virtual reality user interface, or if you're doing an AI user interface, or you're doing you know, a, a watch space thing or whatever you're doing, it's the same. Big screen, small screen, no screen. I mean, okay, then you don't talk about visibility, but more like presence of mind or something like that, if it's an auditory system. But the, the, I do think there is true though, as this one thing I somewhat, necessarily regret but i think that if i was doing it again i would do this differently that's got good number 10 which is the the help and, and documentation heuristic because that's a little bit where you can it shows the age because in the 90s uh, there was more of help and documentation and today i think we're more getting onto this point of saying that user interfaces should be self-explanatory Yep. And uh, the way I developed, I, by the way, there's a side story, which is the way I developed these heuristics was, well, first of all, I did together with a good colleague in Denmark, Rolf Molik, who did kind of like a first version much earlier. And that was based on just our personal intuition. But then uh, later in 94, I actually did a more systematic project to really find out what are the 
what are the most core, most descriptive, most covering heuristics. And to do that, I analyzed a large database of usability problems that we had in the phone company where I worked, you know, then. Yeah. Uh, and so this was, was was PC interfaces, mainframe interfaces, phone, voice space interfaces as well, all these different type of user interfaces. And, and then I analyzed them relative to a several hundred different design criteria. And then I did a factor analysis, which is a way of finding out what are some of the main underlying things that describe this you know, hundred dimensional space and came up with like the, the, the top 10. But the weakest factor loading was the number 10. I mean, there's our rank order, but number 10 help and documentation was even 30 years ago, the weakest. And today I would say it's very weak. Uh, I mean, it's still, it's still, you still give people help. And you know, it help honestly, when people are in trouble, that's what's called a teachable moment. And so you can make, people can learn about the, the system and build a better mental model when they're in trouble and they're motivated to read a few lines of information. But honestly, it's not the strongest or most important way of improving a design uh, to improve the documentation. I, I, I hope no technical writers feel like I'm undervaluing because it's writing is super important. I mean, but these days I think it's more like writing the name of a, of a button or the, the menu items or, or of course, all the persuasive content that goes into a website. That's the most important single thing in a, in yeah. you know, improving sales on the website is the content. So I'm, I'm highly, highly valuing writers. I just think that specifically about writing a big manual yeah. uh, that we don't do anymore. Exactly. If, you, if we ever want to do a manual, we should do it like IKEA, you know, um, where, where it's easy to, to, to get furniture together. And uh, thanks for sharing that. You know, I, I'm just curious, you know, for, for the 10 usually heuristics and you talk about like most things staying true, and I agree with it as well. I was just recapping last night myself. Um, you know, I have a question, follow-up question on, on that, which is, would would we be seeing a 2.0 of that because of AI revolution? Would we, would we be seeing a 2.0 from you? And, and you know, uh, would, would things change? Like, would things, would, would some of it evolve? Would you be adding more, you know, because of AI or, or these things are also applicable in the AI? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think they are applicable. I, I have been thinking about just, just doing a new 30-year anniversary edition like so many other people have done for, for their things. Uh, but I feel like the basic heuristics would be the same. I mean, I guess the main question to me in my mind is, should I take that number 10 out and put something else in instead? But but um, the, the first nine are definitely going to stay. Uh, maybe I can explain them better now than I, than I did 30 years ago, you know. But, but I feel, again, that the, the experience from having use these heuristics to think about and analyze so many different user interface generations over the, over these three decades, uh, that they are very robust. And I think that that's actually better. I mean, I'm sure one can write like some specific, you know, guideline for AI that would be more applicable specifically if you're going to design, uh, you know, a chat bot or something like that. But that's exactly what I don't do. That's like when, well, when we did, you know, web usability, one of my big things I was fighting about in the early days of the web was fast response times. That's absolutely true. You know, faster websites are better. I'm high, more usability, they sell more people, click on more pages, everything like that, completely true. But it's still a little bit of a sort of a lower level design guideline. And so that's a distinction between design guidelines and heuristics. Heuristics are the really fundamental, deep, broad principle. And guidelines are the specific thing, like you know, make a, make search into a text field so people can see it's there. Don't just show yeah. a magnifying glass, but show it show a text entry box. Things like that. That I mean, a very good guideline. If you're going to design a website, make a search field, but it's just not a fundamental deep thing. Um, and that's also the thing about heuristics. The, the, even though I a little bit regret the name, it implies that they have these little bit fuzzy, vague things. Yeah. So they're deep, they're important, they're strong. But they're not super explicit, like saying, do this, make this, yes. like, this thing so many pixels big, right? That's yeah. not what they're doing. So uh, that means that they survive longer. And that also means that I would be very hesitant to put in something that yeah. just today might have a you know, high, high use and high power, but maybe in 20 years would not have. I'd rather have them be, they're already 30 years old. I'd rather have them live with the next 30 years as well. That is exciting. And they're more of like, principles than than the guideline as you mentioned that you know hey do this do that um you know it's kind of like 
things to to really you know uh, uh be a part of you know your your principal design but not not really to guide you and and definitely I, I think that's 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 something that you know most designers have uh you know obviously uh, been very appreciative of the heuristics as well um I, and you know obviously the the name heuristics kind of confused me when when i first started design so i just have to say that mm -hmm. uh, you know like <laughs> glad that you know you kind of took notice of that as well and uh you know we, we talk about you know heuristics and, and 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 i think most of the things that that you have done in sort of like this field of usability um and i'm sure throughout the decades in this field a lot of companies have come and go um you know to you personally or to your consultancy at nm group while while you're there um you know what do you think companies today get right about UX um, usability, but also get wrong about usability that, that you still don't see them improving. Right. Well, it's interesting that that has almost been the same forever. Uh, you know, it's it's early focus on users, and that's not even my idea. That came back from my actually my mentor, John Gould at IBM, like about 40 years ago. Uh, so that was one of his principles. But but that you have very early focus on users. And so I think that today, first of all, we still have a lot of people who don't, or companies that don't do any of the of the UX methods, but we have more and more that do. So that's absolutely great. And I'm so much in favor of this, but that said, they often do it wrong. Like for example, they will do like user testing late in the, in the design process. And that means that whatever you find of problems, you can't fix because it's already too late. You've got to do it very, very early. You've got to do very divergent design, try very many different ideas and try them with users. Don't just, what I think, what I think or what you think is not what's important the target audience is what's important. So that early, early focus on users is, it's one of the oldest principles. And yet I think it's still violated in a lot of design projects. But I feel like, so my, so my thinking is that you have a maturity spectrum. So people or companies do uh, UX and usability more or less right. And you know, in one extreme, nothing. That's clearly wrong. On the other extreme, kind of the user-centered corporation where everything is driven by user data and so on, that's very rare. It's hard to actually maintain that for, for many, many, many years. It tends to happen sort of in the beginning where people are very excited about inventing something new, not maintaining a big legacy uh, space. But but you can definitely do it more or less right in terms of all these different things, like how many people do you have, how um, experienced, how skilled are they, how fancy are, is advanced are the methodologies, how big is the budget, how big is the management support, how much do the other people in the organization buy in? Because if you come as a new UX person and you're kind of like plop into a company organization that does not really believe in it, you're going to spend all of your time persuading the programmers and the pro project managers and everybody like that, marketing managers and so forth, on paying a little bit attention to the UX usability data and so forth. And you're going to struggle and struggle and struggle and get very little done in terms of improving the user experience. On the other hand, if you're in a company that is 100% bought in, Everybody, whether it's the most hardcore programmer, they know the way to create better software is to listen to what the UX people you know, discover in, in research yeah. and to do what the designers come up with. Yeah. Well, if they believe in that, wow, you're already take, took, taking away like two thirds of, the, of, your, of your work that was, was, was persuading yeah. people to pay attention. So now you can only do good work and it's just going to people yeah. will pay attention all, automatically. So that's a big distinction between high and low maturity. But it takes a long time for an organization to grow from low maturity to high maturity. And this, when I say long time, this can be 20 years. What so, does it take? Yeah. I think it takes about 20 years. So from people start, I mean, it's because it's level zero, nothing can last forever. At some point of time, right. the pain is so big that they decide we got to do something. It's, it's obvious that they, they like lose endless money or get so many customer complaints or whatever. It's obvious they need to do something. So maybe yeah. they only hire a consultant. Maybe they actually hire as, as, as personal staff. And they yeah. will do a little bit of good, but they can't do very much good because they're fighting against the culture. Yeah. But they'll do a little bit of good because, I mean, one of the big things about UX is it works. It honestly works. 
the design is better when you base it on the methodology and when the design is better the product is better and it sells more and various good things for the metrics so it's going to be you know not great because you're fighting against that old culture but it's going to be a little bit better and then people are going to some people not everybody but some people will recognize this and those people will on the next project say well let's do a little more and on the next product, let's do a little more. And maybe that person who said, let's do a little more, five years later, that person is going to be promoted to director or something like that and actually have a budget. Okay, now we're going to spend a little more money, maybe hire a few more people. Okay, another five years, that person who was director has now been promoted to vice president. Now they have a bigger budget. Okay, maybe we start an actual UX team, not just two people. We hire a UX manager, a professional person who can figure, make all these things work better. Another 10 years go by, you know, and then the company finally kind of has reached a high level of maturity. But it, it, you yeah. just push slowly and think you cannot go from the bottom to the top in so, one leap. It yeah. doesn't happen because it's organizational change. Wow. I, I, one, one of the bigger, like, you know, I, 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 I hear what you're saying, which is really the mature versus, you know, the, the growing maturity of a company, which, which you know, see if usability or the fact that UX or better UX has brought them business results, which is clear. So I'm, I'm going to kind of like play a little bit of a devil advocate here for that question, which is, which is, you know, if a company can grow their business metrics without great UX, why should they care? You know, uh, if a company is making billions of dollars, right, and 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 they, they have not had a great UX uh, historically, why should they care? Um, you know, I, I'm just curious, how would you look at situations like that? Well, I mean, there's some truth to what you're saying. I mean, OpenAI is right now an example of that. I was just criticizing, saying there's a lot of usability weaknesses in there in chat TPT um, that you can find in one day of user testing. But um, yeah, they still make billions of dollars. And so the reason they do that is they, they, their functionality is actually super uh, useful and exciting and creates much more value than it costs to subscribe but it would create even more value if it was easier to use and if it met users' needs better. And so the question is, are you satisfied with, let's say, 200 million customers who each pay $20 a month? That's a lot of money. But would you rather have a billion customers or 5 billion customers? Now you're going to start talking about people with much less education, much less technology savvy and so forth. You're going to broaden the, that market. And so to reach the, the mass market, requires much more ease of use so that would be be, be, be my my answer that uh you want to you want to reach you know you want to reach more you don't want to reach just the elite or just the people who are very tech savvy or very highly skilled or highly intelligent and so forth you want to reach more and also it's also a competitive thing of course as well because yeah right now whatever whether it's open ai or some other company that's selling well of a somewhat bad product in the from a UX perspective. Yeah. Well, I mean, five years from now, there's gonna be somebody else who does have the same features, but they're easy to use and then guess where people are gonna go. So um, so it's, it's, I mean, UX has many functions in, in, in life or in, in corporations. And one of them is is uh, risk reduction. So, so reducing the risk of these other people coming to eat your lunch because you will be ahead of the curve if they're behind the curve in adapting these needs if you actually do let's say research on user needs so you're going to be ahead of the curve if you do some good design you don't have to catch up it's very very expensive to have a working shipping product and now you've got to retrofit design improvements it's much cheaper to do the good design in the first place and then just code the right thing rather than the wrong thing why why do you think you know which which you mentioned a point uh which is really interesting which is you know it's expensive right it's really expensive you would choose to do it later rather than sooner and 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 you know as an iterative process and continuous process you know i i think a lot of people kind of have heard the term ux or designers or they respect great experiences they want to have great experiences but why do you think it prevents them from doing that when it comes to you know the real world business talks Oh, exactly. Well, I think a lot of it is that many reasons, and, and one of them is intuition goes wrong here because the normal way of thinking about life or the world is that I am the typical specimen of humanity. You know, every single person thinks they're the center of the universe because that's our personal experience. You know, everything is around me. I'm here, everything is around me. 
and that's everybody thinks like that and everybody thinks well if i like something it must be good and if i think it's easy to use it must be easy to use and and they say yes we want to design for humans and you know i'm a human last time i looked in the mirror so if i think it's good then it must be good and that's a kind of arrogance that is comes easy to people who have who are right in a lot of other business decisions but it's like if you're thinking about sort of finance investment type of decisions you know being good at those i would almost say it probably makes you worse at recognizing what's easy for a normal average person because it shows you like extra super smart and the most i mean you can always come with examples of people who get promoted despite being stupid but on average the people get promoted are in fact rather smart. And so if you get to the people who are like at the top of a really big company, they tend to be pretty smart. So that's that's not the problem. It's actually an uh, issue in its own right that they're too smart. And this is actually one of the arguments I like to, 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 to use is that the people say, well, I think this is fine. I say, well, but you are not very typical. You, you're like the CEO of General Motors. Are you gonna be, are you an average person? You know, no, you are not. <laughs> and, and so, so that I think is one of the really, really big reasons is that yep. personal intuition comes back to bite you. And the more so, the more senior people are, because the more they've been right in their other uses of their personal opinions. It's yep. just that specifically when it comes to, to user interface design, your own opinion is not just worthless, but it's actually dangerous. It's actively negative uh, because you, you're so, if you're a very high level person, you're extremely unrepresentative of average people. And so that is a, a huge danger. And then the, the, the second reason is just that UX is relatively new. Now, we were just talking about I've done it for 40 years and I was not even the first, you know, done before me as well. But in most organizations, it's actually new. It's it's an exponentially growing field. So my guess is that right now there's about 3 million UX people in the world. When I started 40 years ago, there were about a thousand. So we've gone 3,000 times bigger during my time in this area, in this field. And it's going to grow even bigger, you know, in the future. And that's good in one way because it shows that it's working, we're growing. But it's bad in another way, which is that there are very few people with 20 years experience in UX. It's a very tiny percentage of our community is, is really, really senior people. But not just in terms of the people, but also in terms of other people. So if you go back 20 years ago, yeah. and those are, those are the people who are now like the big boss in various big companies. 20 years ago, they were kind of like the people actually doing the, the, the actual work, you know? And, and their experience was not working with a talented UX company person as their colleague because these people were not there 20 years I mean there were some but they were basically not there 20 years ago or 30 years ago there were very few of us in the old days and so very few of the people who are very senior today had the personal experience of working with talented UX teams now this is of course different going forward because the people who in 20 years from now will be like that era's big bosses. They are the kind of the low level people right now. And hopefully they had the experience of working with some great UX people yeah. now, and they will more learn to respect and listen to us. But so again, think about the long, really long-term perspective for these type of questions. Thanks for sharing that, Jacob. I, I think, you know, what you really shared is really sort of like sharing the long-term perspective, I think not just in, in, in one's sort of practice in, in UX, uh, whether in the company, but also individually in, in, in their career as well. And, and I think you, you talk about something, you touch something which is really interesting, which is the intuition of someone and 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 being smart, right? Uh, and being the smartest in the room. Um, and and we talk about sort of AI, you know, really elevating a lot of things from us. And as as as, as you mentioned, it's a fog leaf for our minds. How 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 much does intuition play into design, right? Not so much AI, but you know, you, you can talk a little bit about AI as well, but. You know, we, we get this question sometimes as designers, right? And we get posed these questions by maybe product managers, maybe by CEOs, or maybe even by engineers that, that we work with and collaborate daily. And I'm sure a lot of designers in the comments and watching this right now um, would relate to this question, which is really, there are some designs that we just know maybe through our practice and through pattern recognition that it is good and it is going to work. There's no data backing it up, but in the world where data, you know, it's a, it's a big thing, and then everyone wants us to prove that, you know, 
how much does intuition play into great design and, and and do you believe in that yeah oh i i believe in it completely uh but i was just before commenting on the intuition of somebody who's not a designer but rather a ceo or senior vice president or something like that in the, in a company and they're experts in what that company does and they know a lot about that and that's why their intuition in that area is probably very good but if you go out to user interface design, the intuition is terrible because this is going to be based on what they personally like, which is irrelevant because they're so unrepresentative of the target audience. Now, if you take a good designer, now I always say, how do you become a good designer? And there are two things. The first one is the talent that I can't really give you that. You either have it or you don't. But the other one is that pattern recognition you mentioned, having exposed yourself to so many things over the years and including from usability studies and seeing, observing how actual normal people interact with a lot of different designs, not just one design. So this is why it's very beneficial. Actually, it's very beneficial to have had a long career because having worked through a lot of different types of systems, mainframe systems, PC systems, telephone systems, you know, uh, graphical user interfaces, website, mobile, all, all these different things. You know, you 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 add up your 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 base of, of patterns, basically, you crystallize intelligence, you know, you add crystallized intelligence, really. But you have to combine crystallized intelligence with fluid intelligence, which is more the intuition type of, of thing. So you come to the problem from, from, from both sides. And I feel like, like if you only have intuition, then you can be in kind, of, kind of like lucky, but you can also be unlucky and it can go terribly wrong. And so I feel like the best is to the combination and, and uh, UX is really, um, it is kind of a mix of, of art and science, and it has both aspects to it. Uh, and some people are better on one than the other, and I'm personally better on the science side, admittedly, you know, but, but you want to combine. That's, I think, is my, my main advice. You want to combine. And so you want to have methodology that can, like, save you from going astray, but you also want to have that intuition. And how do you build up your intuition? That's like you pump up your brain. It's like pump, pump, pump pump the knowledge base. And that's one of the reasons that there's a benefit for having done the work for 10 years already. And what I'm going to say to somebody who's starting on year one, well, it's like you eat an elephant one bite at a time. You get 10 years experience one year, one year at a time, right? And you build, you, you pump up your brain, you pump up your crystallized intelligence by, you know, a little bit at a time. Just pay attention. If you don't pay attention, if you just spend all your time in, 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 in meetings and stuff, you're never yeah. going to get any good. Thanks for that, Jacob. And, uh, you know, we're we obviously coming towards the end of the session. Um, we might extend maybe one or two minutes uh, a little bit more, uh, just just so that we can answer the, the top questions voted by the community. Um, but, you know, we, we, we have a few more questions, I think, regarding, you know, sort of the future of this time uh, for you and, and really kind of like how, how, how you're looking at it. You know, I, I think one of the, the biggest thing is, you know, for, for yourself is, is, is really uh, you know, constant change and constant adaptation, um, especially with sort of like, you know, uh, uh, being in, in this field where, where you just mentioned that, you know, you're doing your own research and your own studies on AI and its usability, right? And, and I think it's, it's interesting because we're, we're in many ways in the early days um, of, of this sort of like AI revolution. And, uh, you know, there are, there are some people that, that really are sort of thinking uh, if if AI would you know completely replace the things that they do, and I think you answered a part of that question, which is you know it, it helps with the forklift, but you know still needs a driver to, to lift that. Uh, obviously, creates more space for you to do more things. Um, but you know if if there's anything going uh, you know so far in your research uh, that that you feel like you really want to share with the audience here today. Uh, that that designers should absolutely know about going into into the AI revolution. What would it be, right? Uh, what are some of the you know advice right. that that they, that they should take into this? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I feel like you know it's not going to take your job. It's not going to make you, uh, you know, useless or anything like that. It's going to make you twice as productive, and where you can do twice as much in the same time. That means that the price per you know unit of of work product goes down. Without you know your salary going down, just the price of what's delivered goes down per deliverable, and that means companies can afford to buy more. And I think one of the many reasons that UX is it's grown a lot, but it hasn't grown to the extent I want, is that it's still too expensive for many projects to really do all the recommended steps. 
well, cut the price in half of all these steps and more people will do them. And that means demand for more you know, UX people rather than demand for fewer UX people. Uh, so we're just going to focus on what we can apply, which is that judgment and, and intuition you mentioned before. I mean, we can apply a lot of, of, of human added value and the AI can do, just give me 20 different color schemes or 20 different headlines and bang, it gives them and many of them are bad. And you have the, the talent or the intuition to say, okay, these, these 12 are bad. These are the few ones. Yep. Let's just see. Well, maybe we'll pick these three ones and, and explore further. And then you put them in front of users and you do all these, all these yep. things. So I don't at all believe that AI will create unemployment. I mean, the only exception to that is the famous you know, rule that uh, you know, AI will not take your job, but someone who does use AI better than you do, they may take your job. Because if you're like one of these dinosaurs who sits and say, oh, I can do all the old things that are superior to all this new stuff. Well, the new the new person can do twice as much work in a day as you can. Yeah. Who will be hired? The person who can do twice as much work, you know. So I mean, because this is not a small change, this is a huge change. So that's why I think you got to get with the program and start using yeah. it now. And I, one of my many slogans is, you know, start small but start now. Don't sit and wait for all the big fancy project. Just today or tomorrow, whatever the time zone you're in, you know, yeah. <laughs> start using AI to like rewrite an email subject headline or something like that to love five that. five suggestions for another email subject. Wow. I, I, I absolutely love that. You know, start small, start now. I think that's that's really uh you know the way to go about I think generally in life and, and just uh you know things in work as well. And uh you know we, we talk about this this you know uh uh you know sort of like really age of AI and 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 obviously wouldn't be, you know replace designers from his work. Um, and using much more creativity and intuition, uh, do you do you sort of you know foresee any challenges uh, for designers in this in this AI uh, you know revolution? Is is there any, and if so, why? Yeah. Well, I mean, there is a, the one of the challenges is for sure the I think mistaken idea that you can just purely let the AI do everything, uh, because I really think that the quality becomes much higher when you combine the two and you benefit from the strength of both. But I've seen some people suggest that, for example, we don't have to do user testing anymore because we just ask AI to like, what's the best to find? And, uh, and, and that I, I really don't believe is gonna work, but there's always the risk that some people believe in it. And so that I think is definitely, definitely a danger. And um, I mean, I think, but, the, but to be honest, I think the main danger is not, not pushing hard enough. And I mean, I did say just sit, before, right? Start small, start now. But yeah, then next month you scale up and you try another thing and then you try more and more and more things. So if you give yourself kind of a, a year, I would say as a learning curve project. Uh, so at the end of the year, you become a full symbiont, you know, like half computer, half human type of uh, person. Uh, that would, would be my goal. All right, we're gonna need we're we're gonna need some cyborg designers, uh, you know, in, in the future. I think that's 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 really the future that we're going into. Um, and and you know, this last couple of questions I, I think, and then obviously we'll we'll wrap up well with that. And we we you know you you talk about things that will change with AI, things that 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 are that might be a challenge. Um, you know, one of the key things about designer. Uh, being a designer is obviously collaboration, right? You know, collaborate with one another, or we collaborate with people of different, uh, you know, uh, different departments. You know, would would collaboration change with AI? Do you see collaboration changing? I think collaboration is such an important part of yeah. important conversations, right? And, that, and, and would collaboration change? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a that's a great question, and I don't think we have answers to that. I mean, one of the things I could actually fear is that as people get more and more agents, you just kind of have the agents talk to each other. You know, I send you an email that's not actually from me, but generated by chat GPT. You don't yeah. read it, but you have another AI summarize it and write this response. And and so you, you could, I mean, I don't think that actually will happen because you do need collaboration between the actual people, yeah. but that's certainly a risk. And I feel like a little bit going back to what I said before is that what we know right now is that AI creates enormous gains for individual task performance in time on task productivity, in quality of output, and actually in, in employee satisfaction and joy of doing it because the grunt work goes away. It's taken by the computer and the human spends time in, in flow, as it's called, by engaged and doing the more creative work. So all three parameters go up 
but that's again only based on individual task performance. Organizational, as you mentioned, that's what really is important. And, and that's, we're just sort of starting on that now because most organizations have not redesigned their organization, their workflow, the way they do things, which they absolutely should do. And that's sort of a uh, something that will happen in maybe two or three years because organization change is much slower. And right now with this phase where individuals need to get AI experience, they need to do it on just specific tasks. Then collaboration comes comes next. I can hardly speculate. But I, I do think that you know, there's the, one of the good things AI can do is can kind of cut to the chase and summarize. And so that I do think is a valuable thing for collaboration is that if you missed a meeting, you know, right now, nobody's going to watch the recording. This is just not done. Yeah, you go in and have a meeting, team meeting, two-hour team meeting. It's recorded. Anybody who's missed that meeting, they're not going to watch that recording. But they might read, you know, uh, you know this much uh, summary from AI about what happened in the meeting. Yeah. Wow, Jacob, you just said the truth there, which is no one actually really watches the meeting uh, videos. And I, and I see a lot of people laughing and reacting to that, um, actually. And, uh, you know, uh, Jacob, I, I think you know what what you said is so true. You know, with the evolution and there's going to be the the you know changes around collaboration, but it's so hard to to, to see why. And and I just kind of want to maybe add this quote before the, the the last two questions are, you know, which is really kind of scared to where the park will be, and and not where the park already is, uh, which is a quote by Wayne Gretzky. Um, and, and I think it's almost sort of like this time where you know companies are moving slowly because they, it takes time for them to change and. Just imagine as designers that you are there first. You're waiting for the opportunity. You are, you're prepared almost a year or two or maybe three for that moment to happen. And I think that opportunity will be yours uh, by the time that, that, you know, you know, by that time, uh, you know, uh, when it comes. So uh, thanks for sharing that, Jacob. So I have last two questions for you. I think one is more towards a general industry, design industry sort of like outlook. You know, do you see any existential crisis or challenges right now in the ux design industry right uh do you see any challenges or do you see tons of opportunities yeah. i actually only I see, I only see opportunity i you mentioned the word existential crisis and that's why i'm saying no now if you just only said crisis i may have said yes <laughs> because we do know we've had a lot of layoffs we had some big layoffs and right recently before this recording you know we had this big spotify layoff and what's actually also happening is that if Many companies are now turned to like micro layoffs, not a thousand people at a time, but five here, five there. And that's, of course, is it's not really a crisis, but it's a setback. We also know that salaries in the UX field have dropped a lot this year, 23, compared to 22. Uh, that's a setback for people who are like trying to get a job and trying to hope they hope for high salary, but now nah, they're not going to get that anyway. And that's unfortunate. sad. But that's not existential. Because what's not happening is that all of a sudden UX salaries are half of what they used to be. No. What happened was that there was a temporary bump, a bubble actually, during that COVID course bubble in 21 and 22, where salaries went up a lot. And you know, anybody who got a big bonus in those two years, they can just be happy they got that, but it's not sustainable. And what happens is the salaries just back down again. So salaries now are the same as they were in 2019, I mean, adjusted for inflation. So the number of currency units is higher, but the value is the same. So it's like it was up and then it was back down again, but it's back down to the same. And that's not an existential crisis. That's just that you don't get this big bonus that you got last year, which is sad, but not an existential crisis. And the same goes for this thing about the layoffs. Anybody who is laid off, very bad for that person. But UX field, the growth in the number of people is is a, is that's a hundred year trend, you know, from 1950 to 2050, and we are though still many years from that kind of place. I don't know what will happen in the very very long term future, but I completely predict. I said there are three million UX people in the world in 23. Ten years from now, there's going to be three times as many, so nine million people. Six million new jobs will be created. They may not be created wow. exactly in 23, you know, but they're going to be created over those 10 years. And yep. this is, of course, a huge international ex expansion as well, as, as you know, from ADP list. I mean, there's so many people in all the countries around the world. When I was young, it was not the case. It was like the United States and a little bit in Scandinavia, where I was from in the UK. But but now it's worldwide and it's going to be even more Everywhere. worldwide, not just the tech industry or the phone company. It's any industry. 
And so those okay. trends are long-term trends. One yeah. year, a little bit fluctuation. Who, I mean, I said to, I don't say who cares because the person who's laid off, they care. But I don't think it's an existential. That was your word. It's not existential crisis at all. We are in an incredible growth field in any longer-term perspective that's more than a single year. Single year can be bad. That has happened before. Remember the dot-com bubble? Boom, bust, bust. Very bad for anybody in Silicon Valley, including yeah. me, man. I had clients, all my big clients went out of business. Uh, but next thing happens instead. Thanks for sharing that, Jacob. It almost feels like we're just in a blip of a you know longer term graph, and, and that that makes a lot of sense. Uh, with that said, you know, I, I really wanted to answer two questions, uh, at least from the audience. So I just want to show on stage and thank you everyone for staying a couple of minutes behind and you know, so much interesting knowledge that Jacob was sharing. So we want to interrupt and let everyone just absorb everything that Jacob has to share. Uh, today uh, on his rare time with us. So, uh, Jacob, we have a question from from Sarah. Um, uh, Sarah is a UX researcher and content designer in Toronto. So, Sarah asks, how should we talk about including AI in our design work uh, with an awareness of ethical compliance? Uh, you know, she and her team and uh, I, I and her, uh, my my team has used ChatGPT and Gen AI regularly for reports, marketing graphics, and and mockups. So, how should they talk about that? Yeah. Um... Actually, in many ways, I don't think there's any difference whether you use AI or you don't use AI. It's kind of like saying, how should we look about ethics if we're using a word processor to write our documents instead of writing them on a typewriter? I mean, you. the point is to remember the ethics, you know. Um, and if you don't remember the ethics, then you're doomed no matter what. Um, and if you remember it, I mean, I think the one thing I have to, have to emphasize is human review. Uh, because we know about AI does have some of its many problems, you know, like they have all these so-called hallucinations that just make up stuff and, and will make some, sometimes some bad decisions. And so, yeah, if you just never look at it and just spit it out, yeah. that absolutely can lead to problems. But that was also not my recommendation. I'm recommending this, what I call the symbi and the symbiosis, human and computer working together. And one of the, uh, the the so ethics points there is to have somebody look at the stuff and check it, check it. Uh, and if you do that, I mean, it's like similar. Well, how can we hire hire a junior designer and have them have them be ethical because they're make, going to make some mistake also? Well, some some people say that you can consider AI to be like a, like an intern or junior member of your team who doesn't know everything yet and makes some mistakes. Uh, that's actually one way of looking at it. So I, I feel that the most important point about ethics is to do it or to remember it and maybe an even more important point is actually the kind of thing about um you know don't don't be don't be evil i know that was google's slogan back in the days which have since yeah. abandoned but but there's something to that because there's honestly a lot of deliberately unethical design where you are trying to cheat and dis and users and and like for example writing we talked about writing before I mean, double negatives is a very simple rule that any dis any writer always knows. Don't do not use a double negative, but yeah. you see it in in radio buttons. I am not going to opt into opt out to maybe not receive your email or whatever the phrasing they have that confuses so much what you're saying and there's a no to that people click the wrong thing. Now that is not because of AI. That's because they are actually being evil. I call it evil, but I mean that they deliberately decide that. Other considerations are more important than treating their customers properly. And so that, I mean, you either decide to be evil or you decide to be, you know, beneficial. That's the big thing. Then the smaller thing is, well, don't let mistakes slip through the cracks, which you definitely need to do. You've got to check for that. Thanks for sharing that, Jacob. Um, we're going to an answer the next question by Leila. So Leila is she asked a very simple but I think it was a powerful question. How can we mitigate the risk of using AI to improve accessibility? Yeah, I actually think it's not a risk but a huge opportunity. Um, not necessarily right now, but I think in in a two to three year type of, of future, I think accessibility can be enormously improved. And so I mentioned one thing that's actually working right now which is um, in some many doctor's offices, they have these uh, post-visit uh, summaries that they give to the patients of what was discussed. Oh. And, and, and most, most people don't have a hard time understanding them because they're written in medical terminology and two complicated writing styles. Um, 
And so AI is actually capable of rewriting things, use simpler vocabulary, shorter sentence structures, more direct language, those type of things that, you know, a doctor's just not going to spend time and also doesn't really know those writing guidelines either. They're not good writers, those, those guys. Right? So that's a simple example, but if you can actually make medical information personal, I mean, my medical information can be written at, at my reading level by an AI. Now, exactly today, it's going to make some mistakes. And that's what you hear in the media blown up. Oh, the AI made one mistake. But at the same time, it may have, have a, you know, millions of people understand how they should treat their health better. And, and so that, that balance of, yeah, one mistake and a million people getting, getting better, better service is, in my opinion, in favor of the million people. And that was just one example of, of, to me, one of the big accessibility problems is, in fact, understandability of, of content, which is usually written at too advanced a level for the majority of the population's education level. Uh, so that was one example. The accessibility problem that most people talk the most about be, be blind users. And so for blind people, you know, you basically, if you can't see, well, what do you get? You get an auditory user interface. And... I feel like we can have the AI describe things in ways that kind of cut to the chase, give people the information they need right when they need it in yeah. vocabulary that makes sense to that person, not to other people, but to that person. So it can be a combination of accessibility and individualization of personalization, I think can vastly improve. I mean, what we're doing now is we're doing screen readers, right? So we're taking... I'm designing a graphical user interface and I have a voice read it out loud. That will never work. That will never give a good, good user experience for somebody who cannot see to read out a graphical user interface. But to present you know, a verbal um, description, and, and this is not, I mean, something that's done now because that's kind of a research problem to make that happen. But that's why I'm saying maybe five years. But in five years from now, I think accessibility can be enormously improved by using AI to create, in this example, auditory experiences that are customized for that person's you know, interests and skills and everything. And even today, um, improving, so not as severe accessibility as when you're trying to do like, kind of almost the, one of the hardest problems, but for, for older people, for example, or for, for people with a variety of not like terrible problems, but like some kind of, of limitation, uh, I feel like we can we can improve a lot. So I would not call the risk, I would call it an incredible opportunity. Now, okay, we're back to this. As I said before, it's like evil and, or, or good. Well, the same is true here, which is, do you want to care about people with disabilities or not? Yeah. That's a very different question, right? If you don't care, you're also not going to take this opportunity and, 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 and run with it. If you do care, then I think there's a lot of opportunity. Thank you so much for that, Jake. It really reminds me of something that I think Einstein said, which is, you know, make something simple, but not simpler, right? Which is really making it simple, but not in the essence and at the risk of taking out its value of something. So I think, you know, you, you just summed it up really, really well of, of that as well. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we're coming to the last question of, of today's uh you know, uh, session and, you know, Jacob, thank you so much for spending time with us. You know, it just feels, you know, it's a huge honor to interview you, first of all. Um, and, you know, the, the last question, I think it's really about, you know, your, your thoughts and your advice for, I think, everyone listening to this and will be reading about this on our newsletter on ADP list, um, you know, which is, you know, I, I love your your, your advice uh, from for two types of audience. I think first is, you know, anyone that is in the current state of the AI revolution, yeah, they're looking at this right now. They might be bystanders, uh, designers, uh, data bystanders. So one is advice for them. And the other one, I think, is just in, in general, right? Like designers, you know, at this time, uh, you know, at this phase of, of design evolution, you know, what would you say to them? So let me just start off with the, with the one in AI. Like what would advice would you have for designers, you know, in this AI revolution? Um, I would say we have to grab it and we have to actually uh, get ahead of it, not just be, be uh, being, being, being behind. And I think we are behind right now because it was driven by technologists, by a bunch of geeks. And that's how it often is. They're the ones who invent something new. And But, but we have to say, this is a user experience. It's a user experience opportunity and problem at the same time. And so we have to take that, that ownership and, and, and push for 
all these opportunities we just talked about, whether it's accessibility or this or the other thing, I mean, they don't happen by themselves. So we got to push for them. And so that would be my 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 main advice is we got to take grab for that ownership and and not allow really uh, the the geeks to, they they invented it all credit to them you know yeah. but now we got to make it for the world not just for us for a few people so so I feel that's that's an important important message we got to go and actually do it and of course you start to as I said you know start you start small you start now yeah. and then you you got build it. from there on and I think for the designers in general not with disregarding the AI thing I think that um, just kind of like re rejoice that uh, think about all the good things that are going to happen. Don't get depressed over there are a few setbacks this year because honestly, it's a blip on a long, century long curve, you know, that started before me, can continue after me. It's a long, it's a long haul. It doesn't, these changes don't happen immediately. That is sad because I can taste it. I want it. And I, I oh, it's going to take another 10 years. That's annoying to me, but it's, that's how it is. We've got to accept that fact. But it's moving and compare how terrible user interfaces were 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. I remember 40 years ago, they were terrible. And how much better they're going to be in 10 years, in 20 years, in 30 years. And people are starting now, they're still going to be working in 30 years. So they're going to be the ones who actually will, will enjoy this. Yep. Not perfection, that doesn't happen, but much better. So it's better, 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 better. Honestly, there's not so many things where you can say that, that every time you take a little bit bigger, bigger perspective in a single year, single years can have setbacks, but anytime you look at a decade, it's a lot better. That is honestly wonderful to be in that in that situation. Yeah. And the people who start now, I mean, the, particularly the actual really young people who are like just getting, getting in and using ADP list to get mentorship right now, they have so much you know, ahead of them to look forward to. I, I can't even explain. It's just enormous, enormous gains and, and growth and making things better for, you know, all the, the for humanity as a, as a whole, that um, I think it's one of the best things you can honestly possibly do. So, so I just think we got it like actually do it and, and embrace it and don't think of the, there are negative sides. So there's negative sides to everything, but just don't let that get to Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing, Jacob. Today has been, you know, invaluable in many ways for all of us. Um, and before we end off, where can people find you online? Uh, you know, yeah. socials yeah. or whatnot. Where, where can people find you? And if they want to learn more about your next course or your next book, where, where can they learn those? Right. Well, I mean, I started a new website here half a year ago that's called UX Tigers, so in plural. Many tigers, but there's actually only one tiger on the site, which is me right now. But it's called UX Tigers. So uxtigers.com is my new website and i actually have a substack substack email newsletter that's of course you know linked from the from the website so that's actually my main recommendation is to sign up for my newsletter because you don't get every week you know as soon as i write an article bang it goes out and you get it in your mailbox so that would be my main recommendation sign up for my newsletter go to ux tigers and sign up for my newsletter yes perfect I've just sent the link to everyone in the chat so you can subscribe there directly thank you so much Jacob you know for spending time with all of us at the ADP community around the world. I mean, a lot of designers are in the ADP community, so uh, we're super, super thankful. And uh, we will be translating all of this into our newsletter and spreading it, you know, the, the, the knowledge out to the broader community as well. So Jacob, once again, thank you all so much. And J Jacob, thank you so much, especially for joining us today. So, so grateful for, for you. And for the rest of you, thank you for joining us. We'll see you at the next sessions and have a great rest of the year. Thank you. Thank you, Felix. It was such a great session. Thank you. Thanks to everybody who stayed all through the entire session.